This morning, I want you to keep your Bible near you. We'll be going through lots of passages. That's why there's not a focal passage. But we're going to begin in the book of Revelation. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 5. Revelation, chapter 5. And we'll begin reading in verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is a picture of eternal worship in heaven. And central to this worship is a lamb. It's a lamb as if slain. The created heavens and earth will pass away. But these scars on the king of glory will never pass away. They are the only thing in eternity that are man-made. It is a lamb as if slain. And they are a testimony to the love of God. And they are a testimony to Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. You have purchased for God with your blood. You have redeemed for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The church gathered. That's what this is a picture of. The church gathered with millions upon millions. They fall down and they worship the Lamb. And they sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. Why is the lamb worthy? Because it is slain. And you redeemed for God with your blood. Men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Jesus Christ and him alone has the right to receive worship. He is worthy because he has redeemed. That's the picture. What is the reason we worship this morning? We know, we say we understand, and we, un- we express from our hearts that Jesus Christ is worthy because he has redeemed us with his blood. That's what we're going to speak about this morning. Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. Of all the words... And of all the pictures of the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, the most precious is Redeemer. Why? Because to redeem, he has to shed his blood. Redeem, as Ruth said, it means to buy back. It means to pay a ransom. It's a beautiful word. And today, we may think that redeem, or to be redeemed, is just another word that means I'm saved. But it's it's much richer, it's much deeper than that. It's a beautiful word. And there's two pictures that the Word of God gives us to express what to be redeemed means. And the first picture is that of a person who has been kidnapped. It was very common in the ancient world for people with means, people with money to be kidnapped or their children to be kidnapped and they would be held for ransom. And if the ransom was not paid, the 
kidnapped person would lose their life. To redeem means to pay the ransom in order to set free. That's the first picture of redemption. The second picture is more common, and it is that of a slave being paid for, then released from slavery. That more than half of the population in the first century in the Roman world were slaves. They knew what it meant to be the property of another person. Your life belonged to that person. And you had no ability to go out and work at another time in order to make money to buy back yourself. So you were in a helpless, hopeless situation. You could not create income to buy back your own freedom. The only way out of slavery is if someone else pays the price. To redeem is to pay the price for a slave and then to grant them freedom. And I want you to see this because in both cases, in kidnapping and in slavery, the situation is hopeless. Unless someone pays the price, there's no hope because the victim can't redeem themselves. They can't pay the price. Jesus said in John chapter 8, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. They're owned by sin. That's what it means to be a slave to sin. Not only am I a slave to sin, I am unable to help myself. Unable or unwilling to do anything about it. That's the condition of every man, woman, and child, a slave to sin. What is sin? There's a very simple definition that I really like. The definition that I like of sin is simply, I will. I will. The Lord commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. That's simple. Now I want you to picture this in your mind. That man can eat from any tree in the garden. That is millions and millions and millions of of trees. And God says, from this one tree in the midst of the garden, you cannot eat. Don't eat from this one tree. That's simple, isn't it? I think everyone can comprehend that. But what happens? The tempter comes. And I want you to understand this about that story. Adam and Eve have dominion over the entire earth. All they have to do is tell Satan to leave, and he has to. There's no reason that they have to sit there and listen to what the tempter goes through with them. And I want you to get the heart of the temptation. This is the temptation. God knows something. He knows that when you eat from the tree that's in the middle of that garden, you're going to be just like him. God's not good. He's keeping something from you. Because life, true life, satisfying life is found just on the outside of the will of God. And his will is that you don't eat from that tree. So what does Adam and Eve say? They say, I will. I will do what I want to do, and I will satisfy myself. That is sin in its simplest terms. Adam and Eve are now slaves to sin. And this is so beautiful. What is God's response? He calls out to the man, where are you? Where are you, Adam? And Adam says, I was afraid. 
So I hid myself. For the first time, Adam experiences guilt and he experiences misery caused by sin. As his conscience becomes alive, becomes wakened, he feels guilty. When we exercise our will against the will of God, the result is guilt. That's the result. And listen, we've all felt it. We all know what guilt feels like. Every one of us has has experienced that. But there's another side of sin. The other side is misery. You can call it consequence if you want. And here's the misery. The peace that Adam once knew, that he once enjoyed in having a relationship with God is gone. That peace is gone. He knows he's wrong. And Adam hides himself from the God who made him and from the God who loves him. Now he's afraid of the person who previously was his entire life. That's the misery of sin. Well, what else happened? The unity of the husband and wife are gone. That relationship is also destroyed. How do I know? Because this is what Adam says. That woman who you gave me, she made me eat. He's throwing his wife under the bus to see what God's going to do to her. So he blames her for the whole thing. He's more concerned about preserving himself than he is in preserving his wife and taking responsibility. The relationship is broken. And listen, if you want to know how sin perpetuates itself in one generation, it's going to go from eating fruit to murder. That's an amazing thing to me. Anger. One brother kills another. Think about the heartbreak in that family. That family is torn apart. And every one of us have experienced the misery of sin. The consequences of sin. It goes from one generation to the next. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That's what Matthew said. What does he see? And what does he feel? Listen to the next verse. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He sees the people in the crowds that were following him. And he has compassion for them because the NLT puts it this way. They were confused and they were helpless. Confused because of the hurt and the misery that sin in the life brings. And helpless to do anything about it. People are like sheep without a shepherd. That's the bondage of sin. We can't do anything about it. And if you want to understand redemption, we have to have an understanding of the depth of our sin. Sin's not just a problem out there. It's not just out in the world. Sin is my problem. Sin is your problem. We are saturated in sin. The prophet Isaiah said, your sins are like scarlet. Well, what was scarlet? Scarlet was fabric, a very expensive fabric, and it was red. And they would take that fabric, and the reason it was so expensive is they would plunge it into the dye vats over and over and over again, then let it dry. Then they would do the same thing. They'd plunge that fabric over and over and over into that vat till the red dye could never be removed. And Isaiah says, your sin is just like that color in that fabric. It can't be removed. You're saturated in it, and I'm saturated in it, and we're helpless to remove it. The Apostle Paul 
in Ephesians chapter 2, in the first three verses. Turn there if you want to. Ephesians 1, excuse me, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. It says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And what I want you to focus on is verse 3. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and here it is, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. Paul describes Bondage to, bondage to sin as being dead. Unable to respond. Sin is not simply a collection of the things that I do wrong. Sin is my condition. Dead. It's my wrong attitudes, my wrong words, my wrong actions. All those things piled up because it comes from me. It comes from what I am. Sin is who we are. By nature, by nature, I act on sin even when I don't want to. That's what that means by nature. And Jesus understood that. He understood the bondage of individuals to sin. And he said to this, he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. Isn't that amazing? The only qualification that Jesus puts on the person who will come to him is to be weary and heavy laden. God desires this morning to set people free from the bondage of sin. That's his desire. But by nature, we say no. No, thank you. I'll take, I'll take the freedom from consequences. I'll take the freedom from the guilt. But I don't want you. If you don't believe that, turn to Romans 6. While we were helpless, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's what it says. Because we'd really and truly rather keep our sin sometimes. We try and try and try to work our way out of the guilt and out of the misery by living a good life to get out of that prison of sin. But no matter how hard we try, we can't change anything. And that's the burden of my heart this morning. A young man came to me. And he said, I'm not a Christian. And I said, I know you're not. And I told him what was required to come to Jesus Christ. And he said, I won't make that decision right now. I'll read the book of John. I said, all right, read the book of John, then we'll come back and we'll talk some more. So he, I assume he read the book of John, but I saw him in passing. And I said, come here, let's talk. Let's talk for a minute. I said, have you decided to come to Jesus Christ? And he said, I'm trying I'm trying as hard as I can to live a good life. And I said, you know what you need to do? You need to stop trying and give up and give your life to Jesus Christ because you'll never get there as long as you're trying. Have you ever been set free by Jesus Christ? Have you ever ended your bondage to sin? Because that's my heart. I lived here in this church with you. And I tried my best from the time you had known me to be a good person. To live the right kind of life. To give to the church. To help the people of this church. To teach Sunday school. I would try every Sunday 
to get rid of my problem of sin. And then Monday morning, I'd go back to work. And it would all return. And the things that I'm now ashamed of, the lying, the cheating, the love of money, the things that came in my head, the words that came out of my mouth, I couldn't stop. I couldn't. And I was so tired. And I was walking around the block one day, and I said, you know what? If you really want me, come and get me, because I can't do this anymore. I can't live one way out there and one way in here. And that's the problem is people don't understand sin. That's why you don't know you've been redeemed. And that's why there's no change in your life. As you've never said, if you want me, come get me. I'm yours. Do you remember the leper in Matthew 8? He ran up to Jesus. He said, if you're willing, if you're willing, you can make me clean. People don't want to come to Jesus Christ. They just want to live a good life. And Jesus said, I'm willing, and he touched him. If you really are saturated with sin, and if you're really tired of living that way, all you have to go is go to him because he's willing and he's ready. To understand redemption, we have to understand this great bondage that we have to sin. But there's another side to it. We have to understand the great cost that was paid. The biblical concept of redemption begins way back in the beginning, but I want to just highlight two points of the biblical concept of redemption. The first one starts in Exodus, and we all know it. The, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered them from slavery by a display of his power. I remember learning the fact that Pharaoh said to Moses, who is Jehovah, who's Yahweh, that I should obey him. By the end of that account, Pharaoh knows who Yahweh is because by his power, God redeemed his people from Egypt. But in that 10th plague, everybody remembers the 10th plague. God would use that last plague to demonstrate that even though Israel was delivered by its power, his power, there was a great cost of redemption and that was the Passover that was the Passover Moses instructed at the Passover a family would gather in their home they would gather in the home and they would take a lamb the best of their herd an unblemished lamb and they would slaughter that animal that means they would cut its throat and they would drain its blood and then they would take that blood, we all know, and they would put it around the post and the lintel of the door. And God said this, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. I'll pass over your sin. I'll pass over. That was the cost of deliverance, an unblemished lamb. It was the substitute, and its blood was the proof of the life of that animal. Well, we all know the story. The Israelites, they go into the wilderness, and God gives us another picture. He told Moses, build a tabernacle. And he gave, through Moses, a book called Leviticus that none of us can stand. But this afternoon, read, read the first seven chapters because that book is the instruction book to the priest how to operate the tabernacle. And it's very interesting. A sacrifice would take place like this. A family would gather a lamb. And they would take that to the, the door of the tent of meeting. And they would present that lamb to the priest. And the priest had this job to see that the lamb was unblemished and spotless and without default. And then that man would take his hand and he would put it on the head of that animal. 
for his family, for himself. And then he'd take a knife and he'd cut its throat. And that lamb would bleed its life out. And then the priest would take that blood and the carcass of that animal and he would present it to God on the altar. That is God's picture of redemption. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute because there's about a million and a half Israelites wandering around in that desert. And every one of them are presenting sacrifices. We lose the understanding of the great cost of sin. Can you imagine the stench of death in that place as millions and millions of animals are slaughtered for sin? What in a picture. But here's the sad part. Those animals and their sacrifices, yes, God accepted it, but it never got them inside the Holy of Holies. They could never approach God. Never approach God. The Old Testament is going to demonstrate the principle of blood as redemption over and over and over to the point where when John the Baptist is at the River Jordan baptizing and Jesus walks up on top of that hill, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Everyone knew what that meant. He's the Passover. He's the ransom. In order for me to be released from the bondage of sin, the slavery to sin, someone has to come along and pay the price that I can't pay. And Jesus came to earth for that single purpose. That's why he came. To go to a cross and pay the price that we couldn't pay. He would serve by giving his life a ransom to, for many. Do we understand the cost? And here's something I thought about this week. All those little sins, the little private ones that I committed, that you committed, the ones we thought would never hurt anybody, nobody's ever going to know, those sins were put on public display as the perfect, righteous Son of God was hung naked on a cross for everyone to see. Our sins that we think we do in private, they don't. They were displayed. Ephesians 1.6 says, In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to His riches. It doesn't say by his riches. God's grace is never diminished. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, his grace abounds and abounds and abounds and abounds to cover that sin. We've spoken this morning about the serious nature of our bondage to sin. And we've talked about the great cost of sin. Now I want to come to the last point of this morning's message. And this is the application, and I really want us all to grab hold of this. The one redeemed belongs to the Redeemer. The one redeemed belongs to the Redeemer. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. That's towards the back. Chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust in which you, which were yours in your ignorance. 
but like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, and here's the key, conduct yourselves in fearful reverence during the time of your stay on earth, knowing, that's what this is about. It's about knowing the extent of your sin and the price that was paid, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ do you understand this morning do you know that you belong to your redeemer if you if you've been redeemed you belong to him Let's go to another passage. Go to 1 Corinthians. We'll go through these quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. That's where we want to begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. In the church, there was this problem of sexual immorality. And Paul points out a very simple principle about godly use of the body. And they knew the answer. The Corinthians knew the answer. They know right from wrong. And Paul is simply reminding them what he has taught them. Look at verse 19. It says, do you not know? Of course they knew. Paul had taught them. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You belong to Jesus. Now live like you belong to Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. The last one I'm going to cover, you don't have to turn there, is 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Listen to what it says. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all. Why? That so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. Jesus redeemed us. Why? So that we might not live for ourselves any longer, but for him. Are you living this morning for Jesus? Are you redeemed? When we understand slavery to sin and the cost of that was paid for sin, we can no longer live for ourselves. That's the principle of redemption. And you can tell when this truth finally takes root in somebody's heart. I was standing at the door of a Sunday school classroom several years ago, and I asked one of the men in the hall from this church, his possibility of serving the Lord in a position, in a capacity in the church. And he said this to me. I don't think God has called me to that. And I asked him, why why would you say that? And he said, because if if I take this on, I'll have to give up certain things that I really enjoy. God calls a man to serve him. And all he can think about is this. If I serve God, what will I have to give up? God gave his all in giving him his son. And Jesus Christ gave his all in giving of his life. And we think we have the right to say, if God calls on me, this is what I'll have to give up. Man sits in his depraved nature with a dead spirit and asks, what will I have to give up to serve God? The real question is, what do you have to give up that God wants or needs? That's the real question. What happens if God doesn't accept us? Where will you go? To whom will you turn? 
If you've been redeemed, you understand that you belong to God. Your whole life is His. You live for your Redeemer. You walk with a Redeemer. You love your Redeemer. That's when it takes hold in the heart. And there's only one response for the heart that understands that. Paul tells us in Romans 12, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. What are the mercies of God? That's the price He paid. That's His life. That is His death. That is His resurrection. In view of all of that, Paul says, Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Presenting your bodies. He was sacrificed, and I'm His sacrifice. I'm His sacrifice. That's acceptable. That's reasonable. That's worship. Now, that's why the saints are singing this song to the Lamb that was slain in heaven. That's why they're singing this new song. Worthy are you, for you were slain and purchased us for God by your blood. Do we truly understand why the saints are singing this song? You can know all about the Bible. You can know all the doctrines of redemption. You can know all the verses about redemption. You can know all of that. But here's the key. If the blood of Jesus Christ has never been applied to your sin, you are lost. That's the truth. Now, how is the blood applied? That's the question. You repent. Very simple. You repent. Have you repented? Have you turned from yourself as ruler of your life to live for Jesus Christ as ruler of your life? That's faith. That's faith. While we were ungodly, while we were helpless, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. And we either believe that or we don't. And we're either saved or we're not. It's really, really simple. But if, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he is God. He's God. And if he's God, your life is his right because he redeems. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, sim very simply, that your word would take its root in our heart. And Father, help us forget about the past. And Father, by your spirit, examine our lives right now. And Father, if we have never truly had the blood of Jesus Christ applied and we've never given up ourselves and on our sin and on our lives to live for you, would you work that into our hearts right now? Would you empower us, Lord, to respond to you in love? Father, we're such a needy people, but you've answered every need. Now, Lord, raise us up as your people, your possession. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.